Hiya. So today I'm going to talk about the mysterious forgotten dominant sound, which is found on loads of jazz records. Okay, so today's lesson is going to be delving a little bit into the teaching of the Lenny Tristano School, uh, one of the oldest schools of jazz education dating back to the 1940s. Lenny Tristano, of course, is a legend in jazz education and jazz circles and has influenced loads of musicians ranging from um, Lee Connitz, Warren Marsh, even Kurt Rosenwinkel. You know, loads of musicians have drawn from Tristano's approach and his music. And I would say that sort of behind the scenes, I think Tristano probably has had an influence on just about every area of contemporary jazz education practice. I recognise within his work the seeds of many um, ideas that are commonly taught to jazz students today, even though the people teaching them might not know necessarily that they originally came from, from Lenny. Um, in any case, my uh, sort of research here is based on two books. The first is Peter Ind's Jazz Visions. Peter Ind is, uh, I think he's, is he 92 now? Uh, based in the UK, but studied with Tristano in New York City back in the 1940s. And he's written an extensive sort of account of what Tristano was teaching at that time and what he learned from him and his own autobiographical experiences. And that's that book. And another book is uh, by a jazz guitarist called John Klopatowski, who studied with Warren Marsh, one of Lenny's uh, students and probably one of the most gifted saxophonists of the post-war era. I don't say that lightly. <laughs> It's amazing. Um, and uh, Klopatowski's account covers very in great detail um, how Warren teached, but uh, taught, sorry, <laughs> both in the um, sense of like the material he was teaching and, and his uh, philosophy and his approach to teaching. It's a really interesting book. I definitely recommend uh, checking both of those out if you're interested in this stuff. OK, so today we, I think, generally teach two main dominant sounds. And the first is the so-called Lydian dominant, which is uh, based on this arpeggio. So if I'm in the key of C and I'm playing on G7, that's going to be um, a G7 for the first octave, and then we add in the uh, upper tensions, as they're called in Berkeley, in the ninth, the sharp 11th, and the 13th. We call that arpeggio maybe G13 sharp 11th. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, how we play it as a scale, we just put all of those notes into one octave. So we transpose those, the, uh, the ninth, the sharp 11th and the 13th down an octave to be a, you know, a second a sharp four and a six. And we get this. Okay. And that's the, similar to a mixed Lydian mode of the raised fourth. Um, if you don't know what that is, then this probably isn't the lesson for you. Okay, the other one is the alter scale, which I've always remembered as being like a G major scale in this case, but with every note flattened apart from the root. So as a G major scale normally has an F sharp in it, that means we have C, A, sorry, G even, A flat, B flat, B, um, D flat, E flat, F sharp flattened is F natural, and G, okay? So that's basic stuff, and uh, that, that kind of chord has a flat five, flat nine, well, it doesn't have a natural fifth in it, and maybe a sharp nine, uh, sharp nine in there as well, flat 13. It covers a lot of bases. It's very useful, which is why people use it to teach today. Um, uh, now, I mean, both of those scales are melodic minor modes. So um, the Lydian dominant is the fourth mode of the melodic minor, and the uh, super low Korean or altered scale is the seventh mode of the melodic minor. And I think the melodic minor thing... Um, I don't know if Lenny Tristano um, invented this, but he was certainly teaching it according to Peter Ind as far back as the 1940s. So that means that the kind of melodic minor thing goes back a bit further than I would have thought. Um, and uh, the melodic minor was taught, for instance, as a D melodic minor. Uh, which is it's the same ascending and descending. Um, was taught, I think, as a standard minor scale in Tristano's teaching practice. Now, again, please correct me if this is wrong. I'm not, I'm not really a Tristano student, and I know that there are people who are and who would know much more about this than me. So if you're, uh, if you're knowledgeable about this area of teaching and you find any errors in what I'm saying, please let me know because I don't want to get it wrong. Um, but this is to the best of my knowledge and reading what Peter Inder said about it as well. Okay. 
So the way Lenny Tristano framed these two basic jazz sounds that are taught widely today is in a slightly different way to perhaps what we're familiar with. So for instance, for dominant, what he called dominant one, which is like the Lydian dominant or the 13 sharp 11th sound, he would do it like this. He would take a standard G7 arpeggio, just like with the fifth, like normal. And on top of it, you would put a D minor major, minor major 11th or 13th arpeggio. You would put that on top, so you'd get this kind of thing. Okay, so that's your basic sort of uh, dominant one sound, that's what he would call it. And um, that, that's not really anything unusual, you'd find this... You'd find this kind of thing in uh, most modern chord scale theory books, and that in that case would be called a G13 sharp 11th arpeggio. But um, because of the way they thought this as being like a hybrid scale, so one scale on top of another, you would actually get this. So we play the first bit as a standard G mixolydian or G dominant scale. So a G dominant scale, by the way, is just this. It's just the uh, you know G mixolydian, as you might call it. So you take that and you would put on top of that a um, D melodic minor on the fifth. So. This has a rather unusual kind of um, effect, which is that we have one, we have the C natural in the lower octave, but we have the C sharp in the upper octave. Let me do that again. C natural. Okay. C sharp. Keep going, C sharp up here as well. C natural again. Back to G. And you can play this thing in thirds as well. thing just to give it a bit of context okay so that's slightly odd um, and it gets even odder if we go to the, what they call dominant three which is the equivalent of the altered scale so in this case it's very simple we're just going to take the G7 again and on top of it uh, we're going to use the tritone which is a flat nine and we're going to put the A flat this A flat sort of minor major 13th arpeggio on top of that, although I don't know if we've got enough notes to make that work. Um, I'm just going to do it with a single A flat melodic minor scale on top of a G7 scale. So G7, G mixolydian, and then we go up to A flat melodic minor. Weird, and again in thirds. Works really well as a two five one lick. How cool does that sound? Okay, so they kind of hybridize compound scales, whatever you want, but um, they're called two octave scales in in the Tristano school's teaching, and um, they have a very strong similarity with bebop scales in that these chord tones. really featured heavily on the beat. So in the same way that a bebop scale, for instance, you know, one and two and three and four and one features the chord tones on the beat, um, this extended scale features all the chord tones on the beat, it just so happens that there's different chord tones in the second octave. One and two and, so I'll, I'll emphasize the downbeats. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, okay? All, all, all on the beat there, see? Okay, so let's move on to the um, scale that's kind of missed out by modern pedagogy, which is the dominant two. And this very simply is a... Um, Melodic minor built on the seventh of the G7 chord. So G7, we go up to the seventh, and now we got. And we got a uh, F melodic minor on top. See, G7, F melodic minor. And in terms of arpeggios, it's this F minor major, whatever it is. And we got 
that, right? So this um, scale follows the same rules, G7, up to F, then F melodic minor. I think it might be my favourite. Um, and again, there's a 2 5 one lick that works really nicely. <laughs> this sounds great. Um, now, the thing about this scale is um, it has a really interesting colour to it because you have the 13th, but you also the flat 9th, and you also have a sharp 9 in it as well, like this. Sorry. So it has that 13 flat 9 sound, which is often a little bit hard for people to know what to play on. I mean, people often play half whole scales on a 13 flat 9, and the, the harmonic major also fits. I always have to put that scale in scare quotes, right? <laughs> um, and of course, the Barry Harris major sixth diminished, but it's a really nice scale. If you come across this sort of thing, for instance, in a tune like, oh, um, in Gypsy Jazz, we have. And you can play this scale, so it's kind of like, a, you know, a A7 flat 9 go into a. D69 and the tune Manoir de Merreve, you can play this kind of thing uh, very nicely over the top. So, it sounds really nice, right? So it's a really nice colour, and actually it's from that era that I really think of the scale coming in. Um, because uh, if you listen to things like, for instance, Charlie Christian a, on Rose Room, uh, his solo on Rose Room with Benny Goodman, he plays an E flat seven going to an A flat major, and he plays this line. That's just a little bit of it, right? And what is that? Well, that's a D minor major seventh arpeggio with an added sort of passing tone in the middle, which happens to be a sixth or a thirteenth. And then it's resolving to the third of the A flat six, or whatever it is there. Okay. You can hear Django Reinhardt doing similar things, you can hear Lester Young doing similar things, Charlie Christian, and so on and so forth, and Charlie Parker. Right, and it's no coincidence, by the way, that people like Lester Young, Charlie Christian, and Charlie Parker really massively influenced Tristano's teaching, as did Louis Armstrong, for that matter. They were very much into pre-war as well as post-war jazz, and um, this kind of sound, the four minor over five seven, is just everywhere on the records, and it's what I think of as a forgotten dominant sound because it doesn't fit. That's why people have missed it out of these. Um, these sort of uh, theory books, because um, according to modern chord scale theory, every chord should reflect the scale and vice versa. There should be two sides of the same coin. So for instance, for a dominant scale, you have to have both the seventh and the third in. And the thing about the, um, if we just think about one octave, if we just take you know the F melodic minor over G7, it doesn't have a B in it. It doesn't have the third of G7. So it doesn't fit according to the theory books. But the interesting thing is, is that, as I say, this is everywhere. And also I've noticed increasingly when I transcribe and listen to solos that soloists often don't express the third of the dominant and actually it often sounds better not to do so. Um, so this is an example where the theory books can actually get in the way a bit of understanding what's going on in the music if you're too dogmatic about this chord scale thing. Like every scale has to fit the chord, every line fits the chord. This is not always true. And um, if we think about it in this two octave way, actually it does fit, but most people these days don't think about two octave scales. Anyway, I think that's all I have to say on the matter. If you notice any factual inaccuracies or anything you'd like to um, ask questions about or anything you'd like to suggest, please post your comments below as always. See you next week.